So this is Herbert Marcuse, An Introduction, Part 2, uh, by Jeffrey Nicholas, a professor at Providence College. Marcuse was prolific throughout his career. Uh, he's published hundreds of articles. I want to look at some of the major books that he wrote. Uh, 1932, Hegel's Ontology and Theory of Historicity, his first book. 1941, Reason and Revolution, an Introduction to the Dialectical Thinking of Hegel and Marx. So this is a, a reevaluation of his ideas about Hegel. Uh, Hegel, you may know as a German philosopher uh, of the 19th century, early 19th century, that comes after Kant and that sees a, 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 a contrast in history uh, between uh, spirit and freedom and, and sees history as a progressive unfolding of freedom in history. And so Marcuse is going to take that idea that history is this unfolding of reason and of freedom, and that what we really have to do as people is to, to reach into that and somehow grasp that freedom through our own reason. And so there's a lot of development of that idea. In the 50s, he turns to a study of Freud uh, and publishes the book, Eros and Civilization, a Philosophical Inquiry into Freud. This is perhaps his most um, interesting work in terms of its uh, challenges to uh, perceive thinking about Freud, but also uh, challenges to philosophical thinking. And here what he wants to do is, is take Freud's basic idea that civilization is built on a principle of uh, masking our desires and building uh, a society together through this masking of desires. And what Marcuse wants to do is, is take the side concept here of Eros as not as just sexual gratification, but as the drive to freedom uh, that is buried in our unconscious, not simply the individual unconscious, but uh, society's unconscious. So what Marcuse is trying to do here is to take Freud's analysis of civilization and talk about it in a way that shows that we are at a moment when we can free all of our potentialities because capitalism has advanced so far that we don't have to do hard labor anymore. Certainly, if, if that's true in the 1950s, it's much more true uh, in the 2000s and in 2016. And we even see today uh, discussions of moving forward with robot, robotics taking over many of the jobs that people do. So there's an element of truth in Marcuse's analysis of the technological advances that we have made. But the question would be, does that support his the conflict that he sees between the pleasure principle, the principle to freedom, and the reality principle, the principle that always is holding us back? Uh, Soviet Marxism is a critical analysis of the uh, Stalinist uh, Soviet era. And certainly that was necessary at the time. Uh, this is a time when really the West is just learning about the atrocities that Stalin uh, committed to the people in uh, Soviet Russia. 1964 produces One Dimensional Man. And this is a very pessimistic work, in my opinion. Uh, and there will be a, a few people who disagree with me, but very few people. One Dimensional Man is very interesting in the sense that what he's saying here, what Marcuse is saying, is that society fails to question. There's a lack of imagination here. So in 1955, nine years before, he's really talking about how imagination is necessary for freeing our potential for uh, uh, greater freedom and for greater consciousness of our own capacity to control our uh, human humanity and our human civilization. And in 1964, he takes this pessimistic turn and says that the working class has become so embedded with the pleasures of consumerist life that they're no longer able to question capitalism. And so everything becomes one-dimensional. So by one-dimensional, he means that everything conforms to the given reality and nothing really questions it. Now, this is an interesting text to come out in the 60s because we do see the student revolts. 
We've had Martin Luther King Jr. marching. We've had advances in uh, civil liberties. Uh, and we're not even at the point where we have Woodstock yet. And yet Marcuse comes out with this very uh, condemning book about modern civilization. He reverses that in 1969 with an essay on liberation, where he talks more about uh, the possibility of liberation. Uh, 1972, we have counter-revolution and revolt, and in 1978, the aesthetic dimension. So you see this very kind of tension in Marcuse's writings, and we can talk about this as the dialectic. There's a dialectic in history, according to Hegel, uh, between freedom and slavery, between admitting to ourselves that we are in control of our lives as a society, as a community, that we create our own uh, moral rules to, to advance our civilization, and this, this denial of that freedom. And Marcuse is picking up on this, uh, and he sort of goes back and forth between what is uh, dominant right now. Is it the drive for freedom and the Eros and civilization, or is it the drive to conformity in one-dimensional man? And this is a debate within Marcuse studies uh, that still goes on today. How do we understand Marcuse? And of course, we have to recognize that there is this dialectic there. Where Marcuse actually comes down in the end is a, is a good question, but not one that we necessarily have to answer um, from the beginning. And I want to leave that open for you to kind of address yourself. The particular books that we're looking at are the Paris Lectures at Vincennes. Uh, this is a set of lectures that was recently discovered in the Marcuse archives. Uh, they were put together uh, by uh, some uh, people who wanted to bring these lectures out because of what they say, and I think it was a wise idea to bring these lectures out. And they're actually quite suitable for a class in a way that neither Eros and Civilization or One Dimensional Man are. Uh, they're shorter, they're easier to understand, uh, and they are actually much more hopeful, I think, than some of the other work. But they also uh, play with this dialectic, and I think it's important to kind of pay some attention to that. And so the dialectic that is, is at play in the Paris Lectures are, is the dialectic between the forces of domination in society and the possibilities for liberation. And so as you begin to read this text, I want you to think about that. Where is Marcuse pointing to these forces of domination? How do they work in society? And remember that he's writing this in 1974. So what does that mean now, 50 years later, uh, to us? What do the forces of domination look like today in 2016? And then there's the possibilities for liberation. What do those look like in 1974? What do they look like today? Uh, are they still there? So to give you some kind of plugins here, he does say at certain points that some of the forces of domination are the concentration of economic power. The scope of imperialist present, uh, penetration. So where is imperialism in the world? What does he mean by that? Uh, the fusion of economic, political, and military power. Many of you might know of Eisenhower's final speech as president. Pray warns about the military-industrial complex. Is that still at play today? Uh, if so, is it stronger than it was in 1974? And then he talks about this efficiency and scientific technological control of people. And he's really talking about the way management can work to control people, but also the kind of technology that we've developed over time uh, to control people. And today, obviously, that's much stronger. Uh, and you can think about just the simple way that uh, managers and, and corporations can use uh, programming to moderate, or to, I'm sorry, to uh, record what keystrokes and how fast those keystrokes are typed by their employees. So that's just one form of scientific technological control. So these are some of the forces of dominations that Marcuse points to in 1974. And it's, it's a question for you to think about, are these still relevant today? Uh, if they are, is that a problem? Uh, is it really domination to keep control of how many uh, keystrokes and in what order uh, keystrokes your employees type? Um, is there a problem with the fusion of economic, political, and military power?
Uh, is imperialism bad? Is concentration of economic power bad? Uh, so these are questions that you need to think about as you read through uh, Marcuse. The possibilities of liberation are divided into two kinds. Uh, the, Marx has always said that there are two necessary conditions for liberation, the objective conditions and the subjective conditions. The objective conditions, of course, are those conditions that are part of the objective world. What's going on out there in the material reality? And the subjective conditions have to deal with our own consciousness. In terms of the objective conditions, there's the internal contradictions of capitalism. And as you read through uh, Reich's uh, article on neoliberalism, I want you to think about what these internal contradictions of capitalism might be, whether you agree uh, with Rice and whether you agree with Marcuse on that. Uh, Marcuse also points out to global inequality, again, 1974, is it the same today, is it worse, is it a problem? Growing resistance to capitalism, uh, so he points this out in 1974, uh, when there's a lot of resistance to capitalism. Is that true today? Uh, if not, why not? Uh, we have unemployment and inflation. Uh, what was it like in 1974? What is it like today? And then increased competition between capitalist societies. And today we have to think about this, not simply about the competition between the United States and Japan, but really the competition between the United States and China. Those are the two major economic powers today. The subjective conditions have to do with our consciousness, though. Uh, are we aware of possibilities for liberation? Do we know what we mean by these possibilities? Are we aware of the objective conditions of domination? Uh, how would we define that? And Marcuse gives a definition of false consciousness here as an integration into the system. And if you've been listening to this whole lecture, that probably sounds familiar to you uh, in relationship to what I said about the one-dimensional uh, uh, one dimensional man that there's this integration uh, for the system. And for Marcuse, the majority has already opted for the current situation. And I think that's an interesting question to ask ourselves. Is that true today? What does the recent election tell us about that? There are three areas of resistance, though, that are trying to fight against this uh, false consciousness for Marcuse. And that's the working class, the student movement, and the women's liberation movement. Uh, he might point out to other movements, but those are the three that he uh, significantly points to in these lectures. And so it's something to think about, again, today, whether you see uh, any of this as true. I think it's important to remind ourselves why we're thinking about this particular book, why we're thinking about Marcuse. And he really lays this out by saying early on, what the stakes are. What is at stake is not only the establishment of new institutions and new basic social arrangements, those of socialism. What is at stake in the process of establishing these institutions? In the process of working out new social relationships, what is at stake is a radical transformation of all basic values of Western civilization. So Marcuse wants to bring out to us that what we're really talking about here are not simply social structures, the establishment, all these sorts of things. What's really at stake for us are the basic values of Western civilization. And as students who have gone through uh, the DWC program, as students of history, uh, one of the questions that you might ask yourself is, what are those basic values? How are they challenged? Uh, do we want to keep them? Do we even know what they are to ask that kind of question? And I think one of the values of reading Marcuse, particularly at the beginning of a course, is to begin to think about what are the everyday values that we see in our lives and in society, uh, and are those the values that we want? And if not, what are the values that we want? And if we want new values, how do we work for those new values? I'm not asking you then to kind of just embrace Marcuse wholeheartedly and say he's great and he's wonderful. What I'm asking you to do is think about this underlying question. 